Greetings in Christ, this is Victor and the Psalter. I sure hope the Holy Spirit finds you in a state of spiritual joy during this trying time in our Holy Catholic Church. I'm sure that you've received the news about the so-called Pacamama, and I only say the name once because to say the name is to invoke the person behind the name, and that can be a bit dangerous. I haven't been to confession in a while, so I really need your prayers to stay in a state of grace. Uh, this is video number three in my series on idolatry. And I apologize for the somewhat disorganized format of this series. I'm really just kind of um, going with the flow and speaking from my heart um, along with the grace of the Holy Spirit. So, the focus of this series is a very powerful scripture coming from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 until 17. We've already unpacked verses 1 until 8, or 1 until 7, um, and we talked about how baptized Christians are expected to be a whole new species, in a way, a spiritual creation and that we should not think or behave in a way that resembles the old man, the fallen creature. And so that means that when people encounter us, they should encounter someone and begin to wonder, gee, I wonder what country this dude's from. It's like, he's so nice, he's so full of love. I feel this peace when I'm around him or her. Um, I feel like all the anxiety I had before was just gone because I was in this person's presence. Because anxiety is probably the most powerful weapon of the devil, anxiety and fear. We're going to talk about that later. Um, so you should look, move, and act differently. If you look at really holy people, don't look at me because I'm not holy, but... Um, Mother Teresa, um, if, if you were to have encountered uh, St. John Paul II, the great, um, people who were around him, they say that once he walked into the room, you felt this peace, you felt this healing presence that accompanied him. Of course, it's nothing to do with him. It's uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, but this is when people lead a powerful prayer life, when people lead a, an intense prayer life, then they make a space for the Holy Spirit to act. After all, that's why we have the sacraments, because Christ wants to live and act within us and continue his work through us until the end of time at the resurrection of the dead. <clears throat> so I'm going to go, this video may be a little bit shorter because I have to get ready for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Um, and I should have done this in the first video, but I want to open up the Catechism um, and get into the first commandment. Um, what I'll do is I will read the original first commandment from Exodus 20, verses 2 to 17. It's a long commandment. And then I'll go into the official definition of idolatry as it appears in the Holy Catechism. Say what you want about this catechism versus the Baltimore Catechism. I, I use them both. I think that this one was just a more dynamic attempt at a deeper, more detailed explanation of the Church's doctrines. Um, as long as they don't change this, I think we're safe. <clears throat> I know they're trying to, but Holy Spirit's going to have a say in that. <clears throat> so, the first commandment, if you, if you have your Bible with you, I'm just going to use my catechism, is, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make of your make for yourself a graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So that's a whole other video right there explaining that commandment, but I wanted to share this with you so we have a clear understanding of what the actual 
um, the official commandment is. Um, and um, there are some of our Protestant friends who would say, well, don't Catholics bow before Mary statues, or don't you keep statues in your churches? Well, that's a totally different can of, can of worms. This is a piece of wood and metal. This is a, an image, a symbol of Christ's sacrifice for us. I don't worship this. I wear this, I pray with it as a visual aid. So the statues, the paintings, they're all visual aids, but we give them respect because of who they represent. Don't you represent Christ? Don't you represent, don't you respect and honor and worship God? So we show respect to those images simply because of who they represent. And we can make pictures of God because God became flesh. God assumed flesh. Now before that, before the incarnation, it would have been unheard of because Christ hadn't come yet. So bear that in mind. Now that we have an incarnate living God, we are allowed to make representations of what the uh, historical records indicate he looked like. And now that he's risen and glorified, he can appear any way he wants. Okay, so now let's go into the Catechism. The Catechism is very clear and complements this very well. Catechism says, this is uh, paragraph 2112, 2112 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The first commandment condemns polytheism. It requires man neither to believe in nor venerate other divinities than the one true God. Scripture constantly recalls the rejection of idols of silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak, eyes, but do not see. These empty idols make their worshippers empty. Those who make them are like them. So are all who trust in them. God, however, is the living God who gives life and intervenes in history. Idolatry not only refers to false pagan worship, it remains a constant temptation to faith. Idolatry consists in divinizing what is not God. Man commits idolatry when he honors and reveres a creature in place of God, whether this be gods or demons, for example, in Satanism, power, pleasure, race, ancestors, the state, money, etc. Jesus says you cannot serve God and mammon. Many martyrs died for not adoring the beast, refusing even to simulate such worship. Idolatry rejects the unique lordship of God. It is therefore incompatible with communion with God. Human life finds its unity in the adoration of the one God. The commandment to worship the Lord alone integrates man and saves him from an endless disintegration. Disintegration is what happens when we, when we give ourselves over to idolatry. Idolatry is a perversion of man's innate relate religious sense. An idolater is someone who transfers his indestructible notion of God to anything other than God. So the big question is, what controls you? What governs your decisions? Is it when you're going to get your next paycheck? Or is it when you get to view pornography? Or is it um, when you get your vengeance? Uh, it could be a, a thousand different things. But what comes between you and God? What comes between you and spending time with His Word in holy prayer and adoration and the sacraments. Um, so let's go into verse 8 of this special uh, the study that we're doing, or meditation we're doing, on chapter 3 from Colossians. Earlier we talked about how we were buried and raised with Christ. We are officially dead and risen sacramentally. And that when Christ our life appears, He expects us to be prepared to meet Him by prayer, and mortification. Um, so verse 8 says, But now you must put them all away, anger, fury, malice, slander, and obscene language out of your mouth. So anger is a destroyer. I can speak from experience. When we give ourselves over to anger, uncontrolled anger, not righteous indignation, that's different, but anger that wants to hurt people, and that's opening the door to Satan. How many parents, how many people have done things that have landed them in prison 
and sometimes even merited them the death penalty because of anger. How many times did they go into their cells wishing they had not lost control? The devil is no fool. The devil knows that any way he can get you into hell, he'll do it. And anger is one of the most powerful weapons he uses, especially against guides, especially against us. So, how do you deal with anger? Because anger is a reality we all deal with. Um, I do, everyone does. What I do is I try to remember the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are, it, are the weapons of the spiritual life, the Beatitudes. So meekness, um, just when you're anger, when you're angry, try to remember the last time you got angry and think of the results you got. Were they good results? Did they help people? Did you help people? Did you bring about a better world? Did you make things better? Did the situation improve because of your anger or your outburst or your fury? In my case, it never did. Every time I got angry and lost control, especially around my children, it terrorized them and traumatized them. And it took weeks and weeks of me apologizing and praying and telling them that I love them, that I'm sorry I lost control. It took weeks to recover from those moments. Um, thank God for the gift of confession. Malice and fury. Um, do you have any ill will towards anyone? I know we all do, but root it out. Root it out. It seems like such a weak thing to do, but it takes great power to do that because the Holy Spirit will not operate within a soul full of malice. Malice is of Satan. So I know you may be upset about some of the things that are happening in the world and in the church, but don't let it don't let it root don't let malice take root in your heart because the devil's going to use it against you. I find that when I get upset about say the Amazon Synod or whatever, um, that's when the devil starts really working on me. He starts pointing out past experiences that have made me upset, or he um, makes me more impatient with my children, my wife and I end up having an explosion, and it ruins our day. It, anger and fury, it just it's a destroyer. So one thing that has always worked is whenever I feel that surge of anger, fury, or malice coming on, I immediately think to myself, I forgive, I forgive whoever hurt me, and I accept humiliation. If my wife says something that makes, makes me upset, I just laugh it off. I say, okay, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I made a mistake. You allow yourself to be a fool. You allow yourself to be completely humiliated, just as our Lord was humiliated on the cross. There's a lot that can be learned from this image. When Christ was crucified, he was a naked man, presented before a laughing and mocking crowd. So humiliation, it's actually a liberating experience to have humiliation, to be humiliated because you are then released, released from the rat race. When you're humiliated, when you're humble, you are free, you are unchained from the doggy dog, murderous rat race that always tries to, you know, the powerful try to become more powerful than the powerful and the powerful try to get more powerful than the powerful and the, the, the weak have to constantly strive to become more powerful. Um, it's a constant idolatry. Um, not to be confused with justice. I mean, if someone breaks into your house and tries to take your kids, well, that's a totally different story. That's called self-preservation. That's not... You would normally not attack or hurt anyone um, for any other reason, but when you're actually defending innocent life, that is... That is uh, a form of mortification. You're offering yourself for the salvation of another human body. So that's, that's different. Um, so meekness is when you accept that you're just a human, that you will die, that you are biodegradable, and that the only good thing about you is a gift from God. The only good thing in you is a gift of the Holy Ghost. And that we must get rid of obscene language. It's very tempting to use obscene language, especially in our US, uh, Western culture, even religious people. Um, but you have to remember, God gave us a voice. 
God gave us a tongue to praise Him. How many times in the the scriptures does it say how we use our, our, our voices, our tongues, to bless the Lord? So we use our voices to pray and to, to bless the Lord, to bless other people, to say things that are rooted in God's holy word. How many times have we met people who had a very gentle way of speaking and we always feel, we always feel like we want to be around these people because they, especially religious people, good Christians, they have, you can tell who's having a, you can tell who has an active prayer life by the way they speak because there's never this tone of malice. There's never this tone of sarcasm in the way they speak. It's always just direct, transparent, and simple because they root their speech, they root their entire organism on the Holy Word of God. So, avoid anger, avoid fury, avoid malice, because these are not signs of a risen life. These are signs of demonic infestation. I repeat, anger, fury, malice, slander, obscene language, these are all things that are rooted in Satan, not in the risen Christ. So, we must put, we must allow ourselves, we must open ourselves to that baptismal grace so we can become risen people. And I love how nine, verse 9 ends. Uh, I'll, go, I'll do verse 9 and 10 because they're very much um, linked to verse 8. Stop lying to one another since you have taken off the old self with its practices. We should take off that old self, the false self, and have put on the new self, the risen baptized self, which is renewed, being renewed for knowledge in the image of its creator. So he uses the progressive here, being renewed, not has been renewed. Yeah, we were renewed, but we're still being renewed by sacramental grace, by the grace of the Holy Ghost. So it's an ongoing process that won't end until the judgment, until the, the great day of, of the resurrection, until our last day, until we die. So don't give up. Um, we may stumble, we may fall, but what's most importantly, what's most important is that when we sin, when we fall, we immediately get to our knees or repent and, and start praying the Word of God with a sincere, penitent heart. Um, commit one day to penance. Normally, traditionally, it's Fridays. I tend to do more penance on Fridays. What I'll do is I'll skip a meal. I won't eat anything until 3 p.m., which is the hour of mercy. So I may drink water because I, I, I teach, so I need some kind of energy. During Lent, I may not even do anything. I say this not to brag, but this is just something I try to do. Fridays, I usually uh, avoid eating anything until 3 um, as my form of penance. And then I do other things that I, I keep between um, me, between um, my spiritual director and I. Um, so you've put on the new self. Christ has renewed you. We need to live like new creations. We need to be intense Christians, extreme Christians, and wonderful things will happen. So please pray for me. Pray for me that I can be renewed and that I can be a true saint for Jesus Christ. St. John Paul the Great, pray for us. Holy Spirit, we pray for Pope Francis. We pray for all the bishops in the Catholic Church, that they be filled with your grace and your wisdom, and that they preserve the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for anyone who's sick and suffering right now, anyone who's lonely, anyone who's living in sin, that the Holy Spirit may strengthen them and draw them closer to you, O Lord. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.